Well, greetings, uh, great instructors of future leaders. We're certainly delighted to be here today. I want to thank uh, Holly and the staff of the Friends of the World War II Memorial for having us here. She's always, they've always been very gracious to me. And of course, they are doing a noble work, uh, educating um, people about World War II. We do not have much time, so let's get directly into the content. Let me say beforehand that some of what I'm going to say is not intended to offend anyone, but I think that we must tell the truth about our history, and, uh, and it will help us moving forward. So in keeping with the theme, World War II, 75th anniversary, the lasting significance and impact of World War II on America and the world, we want to look at for the next few moments African Americans in World War II and their lasting significance and impact on modern America. There's a lot uh, of content here, but we're going to try to get, get through this as quickly as possible. In order to be able to look at the significance of the impact of African Americans in World War II and how it affects us today, we must go back to the very beginning. There will be a few underlining themes here. Blacks have traditionally been patriotic towards the United States, particularly defending it. Blacks have always, when called upon, defended the nation. Uh, simultaneously, many times they had to endure prejudice. They were fighting two battles by World War II. It's called the Double V Campaign, fighting fascism overseas and fighting racism here at home. And of course, there has always been a struggle to strive for national unity, and we even find ourselves in that struggle today. So let's look at African Americans in the military prior to World War II. Amongst the first to die in the defense of this country was a black man by the name of Crispus Attucks. When General Washington took command of the forces, from the very beginning he said there were certain individuals he did not want. He did not want the very old, he did not want the very young, and he did not want blacks fighting. Now, once this Revolutionary War is off and popping, which in other words, once, once, once it's being fought, Lord Dunmore makes a proclamation. And he says, any man of color, particularly those who are enslaved, if you fight for the crown, we will guarantee you your freedom. At that point, United States, well, the soon to be United States with its back up against the wall says, you know what? We will take black troops. And so black troops started fighting. And the same thing was, we will allow you to have your freedom. Now, after the war, a lot of those individuals who were promised freedom did not get that freedom. And this would be the last time that blacks and whites would fight together shoulder to shoulder until the Korean War in, 1950, uh, in the 1950s, 1950. So now, we end up at the War of 1812, and there is still a hesitancy of allowing blacks to fight in the army. It wasn't such a big deal in the Navy. And I think the reason why you're concerned about that is because if you arm these black folk, particularly those who may have been enslaved, there may be a question of who they're gonna fight for. If somebody's offering them freedom, they're gonna probably fight for that side. The reason why defending the country is important is because defending the country and full citizenship go hand in hand. If a person is willing to lay his life down for the nation, you cannot deny them full citizenship. So blacks participated in the War of 1812 and they were very influential at the uh, Battle of New Orleans, which was uh, commanded by Andrew Jackson. And that was one of the final battles culminating uh, the War of 1812. Blacks defended in other wars, but we don't have time to go through all of them. But the next major war would be the, the Civil War. Now, when it first started, once again, there's a reluctancy for blacks to, to fight. Even in Mr. Lincoln's first and second confiscation acts, what he essentially says is, yeah, if, if there's anything that's being used towards the Confederate effort, it could be confiscated. Well, that also included human beings. And even though it would allow the army to do that, there was still no permission or definition that blacks could actually fight. 
So Mr. Douglas says to the president, look, you want to win this war? You've got an untapped source of blacks who will be willing to fight this thing. And I will tell you that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect January 1st, 1863, did not free a single individual, um, especially those in the border states or anywhere where the Union was already in control. That those individuals were were exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. That Emancipation Proclamation only affected individuals in states that were in rebellion to the Union. But what it did allow, it allowed blacks to fight in the Army and the Navy. Over 209,000 men of color collectively fought in the Army and the Navy. And we know them as United States Colored Troops. There are about 170 some odd regiments that were uh, eventually raised. After the participation in World War, in, in the Civil War, blacks also were in the... Matter of fact, they authorized troops after the Civil War. These troops were authorized, still segregated, but they were authorized. It started out with six units, and after a few years, it went down to four, the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments, and also the 9th and 10th Cavalry. We know the latter as Buffalo Soldiers. So World War I starts, and this is after Reconstruction, after the Gilded Era, era during the, well, at the end, really, of the progress, Progressive Era, W.D. Du Bois, who is, he and others are part of black organizations like NAACP that are trying to fight for civil rights. Here's what he says. He says, forget our special grievances and close our ranks to shoulder to shoulder with our white citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifices, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. That is Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. And so essentially what he is saying is, yeah, I know we're fighting for uh, freedom and democracy here at home, but it is time for us to shoulder with the nation and let's go over there and fight. And I guess maybe what he thought was that after blacks had gone overseas to fight, that they would end up coming home and they would be afforded the same uh, freedoms of uh, freedom and liberty that they had fought for abroad. I must say that there were some things going on in the country during that time. There was an uprising in Houston at uh, Camp Logan where some police started abusing some of the black residents of the town and some of those black soldiers went in uh, to help straighten it out and Long story short, a lot of those guys ended up being court-martialed and they, they hanged quite a few of them. And this was um, in 1917 that took place. Now, during World War I, there were two colored infantry divisions, the 92nd and the 93rd. Now, this is significant because the 93rd fought under the French flag. At the end of the war, those guys got quite a few medals and commendations. The 92nd did not do that. They didn't do that with the 92nd. Now, both of those units were overseas fighting. And after the war, the Army made or had a survey. And they it was called the 1925 Army Report on the Use of Negro Manpower During Wartime. Now, what they did was they surveyed a small portion of individuals in the 92nd Infantry Division. We don't have time to really get into, you know, what all um, these guys, but most of, them, most of them were draftees, a lot of them were from the South, a lot of them were not educated, so those are the individuals who they are uh, surveying at the time. And here's the conclusion that they came up with. They said, now this is in the, and you can Google this. It says that blacks were lazy, afraid of the dark, had smaller brains, uh, could not process technology, you know, um, stuff that was more, anything that was technology, they couldn't process that, didn't have the brains to do that. They were leaderless and non-patriotic and uh, docile and, and, ho and, and helpless. You know, if, if you put them out there to fight, they're gonna probably turn and run. It's interesting that they would be called docile and harmless when it came to them fighting overseas, and yet back home. And this was, this was depicted in E.W. Griffith's 1915 Birth of a Nation, 
black men are violent, they are savage, and they just simply want to rape folk all the time. And that's what came out in the movie. So you got two different um, descriptions of black folk. It just depended on the context. The reason why this 1925 um, report is important is because this is the lens through which the military will look at blacks going into World War II. That is the copy of the um, 1925 Army Report, and you can Google this and pull up the whole entire copy. So let's look at African Americans during World War II. A. Philip Randolph, that name probably sounds familiar. He is one of the coordinators of the March on Washington that took place in 1963. However, in 1941, he was looking to have another march. And the march never took place, but they were going to march for the right to be a part of the military and the right to be in part of the industry because, you know, we're in the middle of the depression and we're about to come out of it. And a lot of it is because we are producing a whole lot of material, particularly war materials that we're going to go overseas. And so they wanted black folk to have a piece of that pie as well. They did not have to march. President Roosevelt ends up uh, allowing that to happen. Blacks in industry. And they also start a group of individuals as pilots. We'll talk about them in just a few minutes. There was... A movie that was made it was called the Negro soldier now Frank Capra was a, a, a movie producer in Hollywood and he and some other producers were actually brought into the military for one purpose and that was to create or to make propaganda films one of the films he wrote or he ended up doing was the Negro soldier it's about an 18 minute film you can google that on YouTube as well and it pretty much talks about African Americans in U.S. military history. There's a very articulate preacher in a church, congregation. I mean, everybody's well-dressed. He acknowledged some of the individuals in the um, congregation who were in the military. This preacher, the person who played the preacher was actually Carlton Moss, who was a screenwriter. And so they started writing this thing. Now, what he essentially does... In the film, he, he talks about having a, a particular message that he wanted to he wanted to bring, but he says, I'm thinking I'm going to go somewhere else. So he starts talking about the history of African Americans, the U.S. military history, and he starts from the Revolutionary War. He talks about all these different people who fought and what they did, and he comes all the way up to World War II. What I found interesting was that when they got to the American Civil War, he did not mention blacks participating at all. As a matter of fact, our most cataclysmic event in our history only took about 16 seconds in the movie and I was trying to figure out why why not mention that here's why after the Civil War there were two things on the table race and reunion you wanted them both to work out but in the long run uh, the reunion piece is what they focused on and not so much the race thing and so they didn't even talk about it I didn't find out until later the reason why they didn't talk about it is because the War Department told them in making this film, do not mention Abraham Lincoln, do not mention abolitionists, do not mention anything about black folk helping to save the Union. So it wasn't even mentioned in the movie. And it, and it actually was a point of uh, frustration for Frank Capra. So black folk essentially were able to join the military and they served in all branches of the war. So let's talk about what did they do. Now, there may be some questions. I'm not going to get too much into what these units did uh, other than to just mention them briefly. But if there are any questions, we can, we can deal with that uh, after this portion of the presentation. Now, everyone is pretty much familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen. 992 individuals received their wings as aviators. There were about 14,000 others who were non-aviators. Um, you had mechanics, armorers, sheet metalists, air traffic controllers, logistics ind individuals. So you had quite a few, but mainly people know about the pilots. About a third of the pilots were single engine pilots. Those were the ones who were part of the 332nd Fighter Group, which consisted of the 99th, 100th, 300st, 302nd Fighter Groups. They went overseas and fought um, in the European theater. 
But there was another group of individuals, the 477th Bombardment Group. Those guys were training to fly B-25 Mitchells, which were medium bombers, and they were going to be deployed into the Pacific. However, before those guys went over, the war ended. But their claim to fame is this. They helped. There was what was called the Freeman Field Incident. There were black officers who wanted to go into the officers club. And Colonel Selway was trying to tell them, hey, you guys are trainees, so you can't go in. But we'll make a separate facility. Well, the guys knew what was up with that and ended up going in anyway. And 101 of those guys got uh, arrested. They tried to court martial them all. Eventually, the black press got a hold of it. And I think when it was all said, then I think one person might have gotten fined for striking an officer, but that was it. But that's another part of the Tuskegee experience that we don't talk much about. There were also the Monfort Point Marines. These were African-American uh, Marines who fought, and a lot of those guys ended up going into the Pacific. Uh, Dory Miller. Listen, Dory Miller was a messman, and he was stationed on the USS West Virginia during Pearl Harbor. While that attack was going on, he ended up manning a machine gun and brought down two, if not a possible four, Japanese aircraft he shot down. What's interesting is he was not trained to fight or to, to fire guns. He was just washing dishes. That was it. But after that, they required that everyone take gunnery training. Now, Dory Miller's story is an interesting story because he probably should have been brought home and put on a war bonds drive, but he was not. 1943, he was on the USS Liscombe Bay, which was an escort carrier, and it was sunk, and he went down on that ship. He probably should have been awarded the Medal of Honor. And let me just say, there were no African Americans who received the, the Medal of Honor during the war. Part of it was because their commanders did not want to apply for a medal and they not get it and then end up with nothing. So him getting the Navy Cross, as you can see in this picture, um, he ended up getting that. And there were seven other Medal of Honor medals that were awarded after World War II. This is probably within the past 20 years. Vernon uh, Baker was the only one who was alive. The other six were awarded posthumously. There are some individuals who participated in World War II, African Americans, who we don't know, who we don't talk about much. There was the crew of the USS Mason. Those guys ended up uh, on a ship, and with the exception of the officers, the entire crew was black. Just short of 2,000 African Americans were at D Day on D Day. And uh, this was a 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, but you had other individuals there working supply and working munitions. A high school classmate of mine, her dad, um, my goodness, um, uh, Bill Simon, William Bill Simon, was there about 10 o'clock at Utah Beach. Supposedly going to Omaha, but they went into Utah. He ended up doing some incredible things here in Washington, D.C., in the school system, and there is now um, a scholarship that is in his name and most people in dc who knew what he did for dcps had no idea he was a d-day and he had just turned 20 years old and i got to interview him miss mary mcleod bethune is critical in this story because she amongst the many things that, he, that she did one of the things she did she handpicked 41 african-american women to be officers uh whack officers during world war ii uh the legislation once the women's army auxiliary women, women's auxiliary army corps became the women's army corps in 1943 which meant at that point it was not volunteer it was the real thing part of the legislation said 400 women to be officers 10 percent of them had to be women 10.3, I think. So that's why you got 41. But Miss Bethune was very influ influential. And of course, you had the ladies of the 6888 6 Central Postal Battalion. These ladies actually went over um, uh, overseas and um, they served. They got the mail out to the troops. But when they got over there, it was that stuff was backlogged and they ended up doing 24 hour shifts and they ended up getting the mail out to uh, those individuals. Of course, these ladies I'm absolutely in love with, these are the Tuskegee Army nurses. These ladies were working down in Tuskegee, and eventually they ended up going to, I think, Walterboro, or it was a lot burned. But they served down at um, um, at Tuskegee for, for, for most of the war when they started. 
And let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven from the left, second row. Uh, that's Miss Irma Dryden. She just celebrated her 100th birthday about four weeks ago, and she's still living down in the Atlanta area, but she's the last of those ladies who are still alive. And uh, you can Google Tuskegee Army nurses. There's quite a bit of information on, on them. There were also uh, African-Americans who were part of the Red Ball Express. These guys, they were driving, I guess, after the breakout from Normandy, those guys were, were driving supplies up to the front and, and coming back, and they were doing this 24 hours. And um, if you can't supply your army, your army is not going to be able to fight. 75% of those guys were African-American. There was a gentleman I got to meet by the name of Nathaniel Johnson, I asked him, I said, sir, where did you serve? And he sort of say, shamelessly said, well, I was a truck driver. I'm like, what? You're part of Red Bull Express? And man, he started tearing up. As a matter of fact, I did a movie on him on YouTube. If you Google Nathaniel Johnson's story, you'll see his story. But it was absolutely incredible because that whole thing, as you can see, was photographed. But there's a whole lot more to the story. There were kids who greeted him. He started tearing up again. It was an amazing story. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can see that. I also wanted to share this as well. Some Tuskegee Airmen were women. This particular woman here, this is Miss Amelia R. Jones. Um, actually, I'm doing a movie. I'm going to release that on the 3rd of July. Well, by the time you see this, it's already released, but it's going to be on there too. She was in hospice when we met her. She had no idea she qualified as a Tuskegee Airman, but let me just say, uh, watch the movie. You'll see she, she got her red jacket and she told me when she left, she says, I want my red jacket. So after World War II, what do we learn from all of this? Blacks proved that they would fight. They proved that once and for all. Unfortunately, blacks began to die in disproportionate numbers. By the time we got to Korea, now the black population is about 12%. 19% of the individuals who died in Korea were African American, disproportionately dying in, in wartime. Now, if you're sitting there saying, wow, what, really? I ain't finished, colloquialism intended. By the time we get to Vietnam, population 12% of black, 24% of the individuals who died in Vietnam, almost one quarter of that Vietnam veterans wall contains the names of African Americans. It was the argument that Dr. King had April 4th, 1967, one year to the day he's assassinated that you know, poor folk were having to bear this this fight. And it wasn't just poor black folk, it was poor people, period. And the argument was that those who were more fluent did not have to go. Uh, don't take my word for it, you can check that out yourself. And by the time we get to the Gulf War, do you not know that 30% of African, Amer of people of color are serving in the military? That's a pretty high number. And, um, as a result of, of blacks fighting in World War II, it had created or it has created better opportunities um, for blacks to serve. Now, I know the military is not perfect, but I will tell you something about that particular organization. You make the wrong decisions and people die. And when that's on the table, listen, the only thing you want are the best people in those positions. And there have been quite a few people who have... Um, who have benefited from individuals who fought in World War II. Uh, certainly General Colin Powell, we are familiar with him, but also General Nadja West and Admiral Michelle J. Howard. Both of them are now retired. I wish they had hung around so I could at least say on my uh, presentation here that they were still active, but they are retired. And um, General West just got her, um, I think that was a third star right right before she retired or so. And, uh, and so those ladies are a product of, of women and blacks uh, fighting in World War II. Also up and coming is Colonel Yolanda R. Summons. She's a friend of mine. Um, she's done a lot of incredible things, including, you know, she's a helicopter pilot as well. She's in medicine, but uh, she's training now to become a, a, a general. I told her, uh, I said, yeah. She said, she's ready to retire. I said, no, you can't retire. I said, there's too many young ladies, you know, wondering if they can do this too, especially some from North Carolina, just like you. So she, she looks like she's going to be doing the general thing. And of course, most recently, General Charles Q. Brown Jr., United States uh, Air Force Chief of Staff, he's got a video. If you haven't seen, uh, somebody asked him what was he thinking about um, before this, this confirmation. He's, he talks about 
for these things. It's it's Google it because I don't want to get into it, but it's 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 really impressive. So although not perfect, uh, the U.S. military has still has been and still is one of the best uh, examples of, um, of of opportunity, and it's it's because you know you want you really want the best to uh, to to be in those positions. You can't just put your cousin or your uncle, or, you know, can't do that. You gotta have you gotta have people who can get the job done. Now, how does this affect us today? Why is this important? Many of us who have matriculated through the halls of academia and history, you know, there is an elusive question that we must always answer, and it is called the so what? Why is this important? There are several reasons why this story is important. Now, let me just say this. I have been in the classroom, and I have had school groups, and I love all of those kids, and I pour all of me into all of those kids because that's the next team on the field. But I have to admit that I am particularly concerned about the education of black children in this country. Young black students need to see themselves in history. This is what Dr. Carter G. Woodson says. He says, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Now, that wasn't my word, that was Dr. Woodson's word. Kids need to see themselves. All kids need to see themselves in history, especially those that are minorities, because I'm gonna tell you something, if young kids think that their history is just simply slavery, we have got a problem. The reason why this story is important because blacks have paid a tremendous price to help build this country. They have spilled their blood in the sand. This nation is the result of the contribution of many of different colors and different sexes. World War II shows us what this country can be like if we come together. And I'm not trying to put any pressure on all of my wonderful educators, but let me just tell you the truth. What this nation looks like in the next 40 years will depend on what you do in the next 40 days. I coached football for 15 seasons. Three years I coached at Howard University. My head coach, Steve Wilson, called his coaches together one day. He says, gentlemen, what does it take to have a great team? We all had our opinions. Here's what he told us. He says, it is the acquisition of talent. You're always looking for better players. Now, this current roster of players we've got on the field, if you think it's a great roster that is absolutely wonderful let's work and make that team better if you think this current roster needs some help let's work to make it better but here is the common denominator i don't care what side of the argument you're on and it is this if a team is going to be better you've got to get better players and guess where those better players are they are in your classroom this fall, and it's gonna be difficult for you because some of you may not be in a class, you may be doing this online, but you have got to find a way to reach these kids. It is absolutely critical that you reach these students. I'm telling you right now, the cure for cancer could be sitting in your classroom come September. An affordable fuel source could be sitting in your classroom this September. A balanced budget could be sitting in your classroom. You don't know what gift is on the inside of those students and we've got to train them all up to step on the field and make a difference. This story is so important because we can see what happens when we all come together. All right, I know that was about 30 minutes. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you, uh, Friends of the World War II Memorial. Um, I hope this has inspired you to understand that uh, your job is absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical. And I just want to say thank you uh, for this time.